Гост на сцената е при мен е доктор Джон Ранианс. Той работи в Оксфорд Брукс университи и следва биология на растенията и се също изследва клетките на живите организми. Познат е на доста широка аудитория като доктор Молекюл, едно предаване, когато води по BBC Радио. И сега ще ни обясни защо учените създадоха зелена флуоресцираща мишка както и доста други неща, свързани с генетичните модификации, как те могат да са полезни за изследвания, медицина, обработка на храни и доста други неща. So, John, you can take the floor now. <laughs> so, добро ден, София. А, wait, there's more. Stay. <laughs> so I guess I should say thank you to Vasi for what I think might have been a nice introduction. I, I don't know. That was, that was the extent of my Bulgarian. You know, before I get talking about my talk about the green mouse, I just want to tell you that my, the story about my morning in Sofia. I was, I was killing time and I was on Twitter and I tweeted this, which I thought was a little bit funny. I don't know if you people over here can see that. It says, why God never received a PhD? And for example, it says he only had one major publication. <laughs> and, and it goes on from there and oh, ha, 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 so I'm laughing at God. Then we show up here and there's an earthquake. You really can't mess with some people, okay? <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry. Now, let's get on with the show. Why would a scientist make a green mouse? Okay, first off, I have to have a show of hands. How many people believe that the green mouse exists? How many people believe that the green mouse doesn't yet exist? Okay, all right. How many people didn't put their hands up because they don't know? Yeah, that's called sitting on the fence, by the way. We'll have none of that. So the green mouse, why would a scientist want to make a mouse that looks like that? Science is cool. I love doing science. I'm a science geek. And my particular flavor of science geekdom is that I like to use microscopes like the lady here looking through the microscope. Bonus points if anybody can name the lady looking through the microscope. Hmm? No, it's not Mary Curie. Who's that? It's Rosalind Franklin who discovered the structure of DNA. She wasn't awarded the Nobel Prize for it, though, was she? Some other people came in and got the Nobel Prize for it. Some very, very famous scientists use microscopes. Risto just showed us in the last talk his wonderful lasers, and, and those same famous scientists use lasers as well. So that's my thing, and I've always been a guy who likes microscopes and lasers, and so I can't help if Big Bang Theory is my favorite television show. It just cracks me up. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, in the real world, in my research, I use a microscope system that looks more like this here. This is called a confocal microscope, and it's the big brother of Rosalind Franklin's little microscope that you just saw, and it uses lasers to excite fluorescence in cells. Now, can anybody tell me what this is? It's a neuron. No, it's not, but you're on the right track because a neuron is a cell and this is part of a cell. But actually, I'm looking for something else. What do you see when you look at that? Oh, who said it? Gentleman in the front row wins, wins the, the star prize tonight. The answer is, it looks like a dog. Do you guys see that? No, it's a little Scottish Terrier. There's his nose and his ears, his beard. Here's his tail, his back legs. And when I first saw this picture, I thought, I was, I, I thought, oh, but his, his front legs are missing. They're not, look, it's, they're just there. He's just, they're bent up. He's jumping over a little fence. You know, like at those dog shows they have where the dog jumps, that's, so, so, the whole dog 
is part of one cell. And we can see some of the organelles that are inside of cells. Now, in the first talk, Andrew mentioned one of those organelles. He said the M word. Which one was that? Mitochondria. So it turns out it doesn't matter which language you speak or how much formal education you have, everybody for some reason has the word mitochondria burned into their brains. So we're not looking at mitochondria here. The nucleus of the cell is that hazy green region there. This green stuff is showing a network pattern. What organelle is that going to be? It's a membrane system. What's it specifically called? Oh, okay, Mr. Big Smarty Pants Scientist down here with his lasers just figured out that yes, <laughs> that's the endoplasmic reticulum and you know it because it comes in smooth and rough, SER and RER. That's, that's one of the organelles that I study for a living. The little red dots, if you can see them, are the Golgi bodies going around in this cell. But what's, what's really cool about the microscopes that I use that illuminate the cells with lasers is that they let me study living cells. so the whole dog can be put in motion. And I can make time-lapse videos of living cells, and we can watch all of the organelles moving around inside them. And that teaches us quite a lot. Now, I've been doing biology for a number of years, and when I first learned about biology, and they were teaching us about the organelles inside of cells, it was all from pictures in a book. And the endoplasmic reticulum wasn't shown as this amazing, moving, green network. It was shown as a little line and it had a label that said endoplasmic reticulum. <laughs> Years later, I get the big microscope here, and I put one of these living cells on it, and we start making time-lapse images, these videos that you're looking at. Blew me away, absolutely, completely, to see the, oh, and by the way, I should just stop that plane because I found out that, stop. I found out that if I continue talking in a monotone like this and you keep staring at that going around, that I'll have you hypnotized. You'll all be clucking like chickens or something later on, which is, all, which is really funny. Anyway, I, I was amazed to see that whole world, that universe that exists down inside the cell. And so right away, me and the other scientists that I work with, the, these, these, some of these people are professors and they've got massive big brains. And they looked at that and they said, how does it move? Why does it move? So all of the big, hard-hitting scientific questions. And so we actually, we actually took those couple of simple questions and we parlayed them into quite a few papers in scientific journals. We figured out what it is that drives this. Which, what, what, it, what is it that provides the force that makes it move around? But more importantly for us, it was why is it moving around and why is that important? for the life of the cell, and for the life of all of you, by the way, because while you're sitting here listening to me, this is going on inside all of the trillions and trillions of cells that make up your body. It's a huge energy requiring process. So I study living cells using laser microscopes. That's what I do for a living. Ah, uh, right, 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 I forgot. We're supposed to be talking about the green mouse. Does it really exist? Take a look at this, and I don't think you'll be too surprised, really. That's a bit loud. This mouse looks normal. And I don't actually want to hear him. I far more prefer the sound of my own voice. Now, did you all see that? That little mouse that looked fairly normal until the excitation light was put on up above him, and he turns fluorescent. Look at him, this one here. He's covered in fur. So you can just see the fluorescence where his ears are. This here is what's called a naked mouse. He's a mutation that doesn't have hair, but there's a couple of key messages I want you to realize when looking at these pictures of this little mouse. The mouse is completely happy, except that there's a man holding his tail. But the mouse seems, seems perfectly happy and healthy. He eats. He's completely capable, by the way, of reproducing and producing little offspring that are also green and fluorescent. So, the green fluorescence that you see in the mouse doesn't hurt the mouse in the slightest. And by the way, the mouse isn't even fluorescing. 
most of the time because as the mouse lives in its cage in the lab or wherever it happens to live, the excitation wavelengths of light that are needed to make it green aren't shining on it. So, for example, I could be a green fluorescent human right now and you wouldn't know it. Risto, you should get your laser out and shine it on me and see, see, see what happens here. How does this work? Do I, am I green and fluorescent? We don't know. Anyway, so there, that, that's the answer. That was the question, the green fluorescent mouse, why would a scientist make it? There's more to the story because the question is not, does it exist? The question is, why does it exist? Why would a scientist make? Wait, wait, let's wait for the little naked one again. Where is he? Oh, look at that. Oh, a little cutie. Why would a scientist make something like that? Because, is it because like scientists are, are crazy? Is it, uh, well, okay, a lot of you are probably scientists. You're obviously all interested in science. Maybe you make something like a fluorescent green mouse because you can, right? It's the same as going and climbing a mountain. I'm climbing a mountain because I can. I now have the power to make a mouse that's fluorescent, but but here's another thing about science. It requires funding. I'm looking at the other scientists to see how excited they are about this. You, you, to conduct experiments in a scientific research laboratory, you have to write away to your government and, and companies and other places and say, can you give me half a million dollars? Or, or a million euros or something like that to do this research. And, and, and they say, well, maybe, tell us what the research is. And if I say, oh, I want to make a fluorescent green mouse. Okay, you're not going to get funding for that unless there's a very good reason why you want to make a fluorescent green mouse. And by the way, it's not good to say, like, Dr. Evil. <laughs> that, that also doesn't work. So I was telling you about those smart scientists asking the highly scientific questions earlier. And, and there's a couple questions we can ask about the little green mouse. Um, how did scientists make the green mouse in the first place? And more importantly, what is it good for? Because believe me, there are thousands of research labs around the world right now that are using the technology that made the green mouse to do really, really important work. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So first off, how did they make it? Oh, before that, does anybody recognize what this is? Yeah, that's the Nobel Prize. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people think more about the million dollars that they're going to give the winner, but that's what the Nobel Prize looks like. So why am I talking about the Nobel Prize? That's because the technology that went into making the green mouse was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2008. And I can tell you, as a scientist who was doing science the old way before about the year 1999 or 2000, as soon as the new way, the Nobel Prize winning way came along, the science that I do, studying cells, changed absolutely, completely, and for the better. That's the Nobel Prize. Now, so I've got to tell you the story about three big winners and a truck driver. That's just because I'm partial to telling random stories sometimes. Maybe I'll tell you a story about three big winners. We can assume then, looking at this picture, that these are the three big winners, and I think that's fairly self-explanatory. You might not know where I'm going with this, but I hope it becomes clear as I go on for a little bit. So, first of the big winners. Osamu Shimamura, Japanese man, born in 1928, which makes him, what, 85, 86 now? I'm trying to do math in my head while I stand here. He's still going strong. He still goes around talking about this wonderful technology. Now, here's a little aside. When I was invited to come here to Sophia to speak to you, Somebody pointed out that the big science guy that was speaking before me was going to have all kinds of cool props. He didn't even leave the microwave oven for me I, in case I needed to heat up my coffee or something. But all the lasers and balloons and all that stuff, and I got nothing. I'm honest, I, I couldn't bring any fluorescent green mice with me. They don't let them travel across borders. Um, 
But here's Shimamura, and Shimamura's great display that he does when he goes and he talks about his fantastic science discovery is that he holds up a little bottle of liquid and he shines a UV light through it and he excites the fluorescence. Well, you guys have seen it already, haven't you? And Risto was nice enough to leave this here for me. That's not the exact same liquid that he's holding up and exciting the green fluorescence in there, but it is the exact same color, and the principle of it giving off light is the exact same thing. So I could stand here like this, pretending that I'm Osamu Shimamura, and this is what he does. He says, look at this, I discovered this, and they gave me a Nobel Prize. So I gotta tell you where what he was doing as a student in the late 1950s, Shimamura went to work at a lab in the northwestern part of the United States. And him and his supervisor started to look at these guys here. These are jellyfish. And this is a jellyfish that in particular is called Aquaria victoria. And they noticed something very curious about this jellyfish. Is this a movie? Yes, it is. very pleasing view of the jellyfish swimming around, but these jellyfish do something really, really fantastic. And that's what Shimamura got working on. Here's the same jellyfish. And now you see the green fluorescence. This is a, a highly magnified picture of the little rim of the jellyfish right there. And you can see these little nodules within the jellyfish that glow with that bright green and fluorescent color. And Shimamura and his supervisor said, why is the thing glowing? What makes it do that? And so as an inquiring scientist, what did Shimamura do? He collected 10,000 jellyfish and he chopped them all up. That's what, you know, animal rights activists should have been all over him. Chopped up all the jellyfish and extracted all the protein from them. And by the way, when he goes to a conference, he even shows his little jellyfish chopper machine. He's still got it. It looks like if you've ever eaten bagels and you've seen a bagel slicer. I don't even know why they need a bagel slicer. You can just use a knife. But anyway, he would, he would collect this stuff here. And he was the one that purified whatever it is that's making the green fluorescence. So we heard a little bit about this in the talk before, but just in case there's anybody in the audience that doesn't know what this magical substance is, that's a question I ask my students. And I say, if you were a chemist or a a biochemist and you discovered a protein and the protein was fluorescent and when it was fluorescent it looked green, what would you call it? And, uh, sorry? Master Yoda. Master Yoda. Ah, yeah, you should have been the one naming it. So, so, when you ask students this question, they think of all these great big science words. Chlorophyll is one that people say quite often, although it fluoresces red, by the way. But, you know, when you're in the shower in the morning and you're washing your hair and you read the ingredients in the shampoo and they're all great big, huge, long words, everybody expects that scientists are going to make up great, huge, long words. Well, you know now that the name they came up with was green fluorescent protein. (laughs) That completely cracks me up, and it makes me realize that scientists sometimes can have a sense of humor. So I don't know what the proper chemical name for a giant protein is, but here's a couple of key facts about green fluorescent protein, or GFP. Key fact number one is that it's a protein, and you know that because it says it in the name. And key fact number two is that when you shine the proper excitation light on it, it fluoresces. And so it looks like this here. All right? So we've got a green fluorescent protein. Shimamura, the man that I'm talking about, the first of the winners, thought this was rather amazing. And he spent the next several years uh, collecting more jellyfish, I suppose, but also trying to figure out what the natural biological function of such a protein would be. Why does a jellyfish need to have a protein that's green and fluorescent? And that's still an open question, in fact. We don't really know. Some people, the evolutionary biologists, and me, amongst others, would say, obviously, 
It has something to do with a mating display. They must flash it on to attract mates or something like that. They don't seem to. People have studied this quite extensively. It doesn't seem to be involved in mating at all. Somebody else has come up with the theory that it just acts like a sunscreen. It protects, it, it has antioxidant properties, and it just protects the jellyfish that are at the surface from harsh UV rays or something like that. I don't really know. But anyway, I do use GFP in my research. And I'm going to give you this really, really quick review of the basis of what life is and how we work, okay? This is called the central dogma of biology. And what it is, is that we all have DNA. And we've heard quite a lot about DNA in the first talk today. And DNA encodes all of the genes that you have. And you have, each of you, approximately 25,000 genes. And those 25,000 genes determine all of your genetically encoded characteristics. So here's what a gene does. This is a chromosome, and the chromosome is made up of the DNA, and you can see that the code of life is in all the C's and T's and A's and G's of the code. Well, when the machinery within the cell reads the code, it makes a messenger RNA, which I'm going to skip for the minute, and the messenger RNA is eventually translated into a protein. And you can see that we've got a gene here that's making this protein that's colored green. There's another gene here that makes another protein. So, uh, in, in quite simplistic terms, if you have 25,000 genes, that means you've got 25,000 different proteins. In actual fact, it's much more complicated than that. You've got a lot more than 25,000 proteins, but 25,000 is a big enough number to work with. It's why we all look different, because we all have slight variations on those different proteins. Anyway, anyway, that was a quick review lesson of biology. People hearing about Shimamura's great discovery said, wait a minute. This is a protein, green fluorescent protein. It's a protein. And if it's a protein, that means that there's a gene for it. See, now that's different. If I look at what's in the light bulb here, that's an organic dye. And it just is excited and it fluoresces, but it's not a protein. It's not composed of amino acids. A protein is made up of amino acids and is encoded for by the cell. And the first time I ever heard that, I thought, oh man, this is really, really exciting. Because what it means is that if a cell has the DNA, the cell will make its own fluorescence. You see, in biology, up until the time this was discovered, if you wanted to mark things inside of a cell with a fluorescent stain, you had to inject the stain into the cell or something like that. And that wasn't a process that would last. I couldn't make those great long time-lapse images of cells dividing and things. Couldn't do it. Now we've got the technology to do that because a protein is encoded by DNA. Here's scientist number two of the four scientists that I'm going to tell you about. And scientist number two is called Douglas Prasher. Come back, that's scientist three there. Douglas Prasher, as a young man, was working away in a biology lab, and he got into biology in the early 1980s, right at a key time. And I don't know if everybody knows what I mean when I say molecular biology. Molecular biology is the kind of biology you do when you're playing with DNA. If I wanted if I want to find a gene, and Andrew told us earlier about the human genome sequence, how now we know where all the genes are and what all the DNA codes are, we didn't have that sort of genomics information back in the early 80s when Prasher was working on this, but his boss said, let's see if we can get the DNA from the jellyfish. Remember, this gene comes from a jellyfish. Let's see if we can get the DNA from a jellyfish and get the sequence so that we understand what sequence of DNA codes for such a wonderful, bright, fluorescent thing. And that's what he spent his time doing. And he spent three or four years getting closer and closer to finding that gene. Do you know how long it would take nowadays? Uh, not even weeks. It would take you a couple of days to do the molecular biology that he spent years and years doing. That doesn't mean that he wasn't very good at biology. 
what it does mean is that they didn't have the tools and techniques that we have now. So in an earlier picture, we saw a graph, not in my talk, in Andrew's talk earlier, and it was how cheap whole genome sequencing has become from a million, was it a million? Hundred million, thank you, dollars, way back in, in the Human Genome Project, late 90s, 2000, down to now what we're calling the thousand dollar or the thousand pound genome. It's getting really, really cheap indeed. Uh, the techniques that he used are things that I can do really readily in my lab right now, just in a couple of days, but only because of the work of pioneering people like Douglas Prasher have we developed those techniques that let us, let us find genes and play with DNA. Scientist number three is this one here. That's Martin Chalfie. Martin Chalfie is somebody who picked up on the idea that Douglas Prasher, the previous guy, was onto a good thing. He said, oh, what's he done? He's found the gene. He's looked in the DNA of the jellyfish, and he's found the gene that makes the green fluorescence. You know, by the way, Douglas Prasher, let's go back. Douglas Prasher found the gene, but then he finished his PhD studies. And he looked around for some funding so that he could continue his work. Remember I told you, you have to get funding. And he probably said something like, oh, I'm trying to make a fluorescent gene. And the people that were giving out the money said, no, that doesn't sound sensible at all. So he didn't get funding, and after a few years trying to find a, a job that would let him continue his research, he dropped out of science. This fellow, Martin Chalfie, talked to Douglas Prasher and Douglas Prasher's boss and said, that's really interesting that he found the gene. And he's got the gene, and he's got it, by the way, stored in bacterial cells. He's done what's called cloning. And the word cloning has some evil, awful overtones with some people, but if you do biology, it doesn't mean anything other than we copied that small sequence of DNA that the gene is in, and we put it into a bacteria just so we could multiply the gene so that we could work with it. Well, that's where Prasher left it. He'd cloned the gene from the jellyfish, put it in some bacteria, left it in the freezer. You can freeze bacteria solid. They don't mind. Chalfie said, can you send me those bacteria that have that gene in it? Look at this. Here's a few bacteria here. And this is a time-lapse image of these bacteria growing. Let's watch what happens. So the green fluorescence switches on and it starts to develop until by the time a certain amount of time has passed, these bacteria are growing and dividing, and the green fluorescence from this gene is really, really coming out. And that would have been an absolutely astounding movie at the time. And there's one small thing that you have to consider here. Where's the gene from? Jellyfish. Now, some scientists and his team of workers have put the gene into a bacterium. So bacteria are only very, very, very distantly related to jellyfish. But the gene is in a bacteria, and the machinery of the cell reads the gene, and it makes the protein, and the protein fluoresces. That's amazing. That is absolutely incredible. You can take a gene from one organism and put it in another organism and make it make it work. And what the beauty of that is from an evolution perspective, it shows the continuity of life. It shows what Andrew was talking about earlier, the fact that we've all developed from a common ancestor going on four billion years ago. That machinery evolved once and all the branching and bifurcation has happened since then, but the bacterium way down here is related to the jellyfish way up here. The gene from the jellyfish will work in the bacteria. That's, that's just absolutely amazing. So that's Martin Chalfie. And by the way, the woman in that picture is called Thule Hazelrig. She is the wife of Martin Chalfie. And she's also a very famous player in the GFP story. She figured out a, a far more technical trick 
than I have time to explain to you right now, but she's another one of the big famous scientists that was involved in this. I don't know who the dog is. I, I don't know if the dog is green fluorescent either. It would be funny if it was. Maybe I should color it in with Photoshop. So what I was talking about was this idea of cloning a gene. They took the gene from the jellyfish and they put it into a bacteria, let's say. How do you do that? How do you add a gene to an animal? Well, it really, when I first started hearing about these techniques, I didn't do this sort of stuff. I'm a plant biologist. I, I, I was a lumberjack in Canada, and I was climbing giant conifer trees. I had nothing to do with jellyfish or genes, any of that. And people started talking about all of this, how do you put a gene into, a, into another animal? And I pictured these great, big, science fiction, fantastic labs. When you see the truth of it, it's not so science fiction. A whole, the whole DNA from an organism just fits in a little tiny tube. And that little tiny tube just has a little drop of clear liquid in the bottom of it. And scientists do tricks by adding enzymes and other chemicals to the tube. They can cut the DNA, they can copy the DNA, and, and it all fits in a little teeny tiny droplet. It's magical, and it's all based on what goes on naturally in the cell. So if I wanted to put a gene from a jellyfish into this chromosome in a different animal here, the first thing I would do is cut the chromosome, and you cut the chromosome in a test tube using an enzyme, and it splits it open like that. And then I would insert my gene. Maybe that's the GFP gene that I got from the jellyfish. So that's it popping in there. And then what would happen is the cell's machinery would read the sequence that's within the gene. And that's the cell's machinery there. That's a, a molecule called, I was going to say DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase. That's what that is. And that reads that thing. And this is the process of making a protein from the genetic information that's stored in the DNA. So the inserted gene makes a new protein, and this is what happens. If, if the gene that you put in there was the gene sequence for GFP, then GFP is made, and the green fluorescent protein fills up the cell, which explains this little guy here. Every single cell in that mouse's body has the gene for green fluorescent protein. And so all of the cells are full of the protein, and when you shine the appropriate light on, it excites the fluorescence, and that's what you see. I'm still, I'm still telling stories about scientists here. I'm up to scientist number four or five now, depending how you're counting them. So this guy's name is Roger Chen, turning green into gold by harnessing natural and human diversity. He's talking about in 2009. This doesn't look like much until you realize what it is. That's a Petri dish that has bacteria growing on it. And the bacteria that spell out Chen Lab are bacteria that express not only green fluorescent protein. See the N, that looks pretty green, doesn't it? But look there, the B and the T are in red, and the S and the L are orange, and there's some yellow. And even though I couldn't understand much of what Haristo was saying, he showed the picture already, didn't he? Look at this. Look at this down on the bottom. Pay no attention to this up here for a minute. If you look at all those test tubes, you heard about GFP. That's this greenish colored one here. That's the enhanced GFP. But what Roger Chen figured out how to do was to take the gene sequence for GFP and make very small alterations to it so that the color shifted. And you've got yellow fluorescent protein and blue fluorescent protein, um, starting with another fluorescent protein, which was slightly reddish. We've now got all sorts of other flavors of fluorescent proteins. And by the way, you won't be able to read it on the bottom of the slide, but it makes you really, really hungry when you see the names of these things because they call them strawberry and tangerine and banana and what else is there? Oh, I can't even read them. Plum. Looks absolutely delicious. So now, tell me, why is Roger Chen holding a glass of champagne? There's your clue. So the story was about three big winners and a truck driver. So I told you about four men. 
How many people can win a Nobel Prize at a time? Everybody say three. Three people only can win a Nobel Prize in any one category in any year. So when the Nobel Prize Committee are looking at all of the people that have contributed to a development in science research, they have to say, okay, it'll be this one, and eeny, meeny, miny, mo, this one, and uh, oh no, not her, and maybe this one here. That's the way it works. It really, really is, and it's a secret process, but I think there was a little bit of disappointment, honestly, on the day the prize was announced in 2008, because Osamu Shimamura, the guy that discovered the protein in the first place, chopped up all the jellyfish, remember? Of course, he gets the award. If he hadn't discovered it, we wouldn't know about it. Um, Martin Chalfi, the one that first got that protein from the jellyfish working in a bacteria. Pretty good, maybe. Roger Chen, the technology already existed. He made a whole bunch of different colors. Who's the, who's the one I'm missing? Ah, the guy, Douglas Prasher the one that did all the work for all those years during his PhD that cloned the gene, but then couldn't get funding and dropped out of science. Wouldn't he be one of the big winners? Yeah. No. 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 No, it turns out that he dropped out of science and he was driving, they call it in America, the courtesy van. So a car dealership had a little truck. And so when you would drop off your car to be serviced, Douglas, this is him here, would drive out and pick you up and drive you to your office or something while they were working on your car. So that's what became of the man that first isolated the DNA from the jellyfish. So these three were announced as the winners. I'm not belittling, by the way, the awarding of the Nobel Prize to GFP because it saved my life. It's my entire research is based on GFP. It's absolutely amazing. I think the award should have gone to this guy, one of these two, and this guy here. He, um, he by the way, was interviewed the day after the Nobel Prize was awarded, and they said, oh, so what do you think about your discovery being awarded the Nobel Prize to three other people? And he said, well, I hope they take me out to lunch. Uh, I don't know if you remember in the much earlier picture I showed you of Douglas Prasher, he was wearing a lab coat and sitting in front of a microscope. He since has gone back into science now, and he's working in Roger Chen's lab. So that, that's nice, and he says that he's happy enough with that. Anyway, we've got to move on from the story of the Nobel Prize. We've got to talk about the technique. Now, I've been avoiding saying the words genetic modification until right now because I thought that somebody in the back row was going to jump up and start throwing things at me because genetic modification is evil. <laughs> so, is genetic modification evil? Is, is, is GM, as we call it, is it good or is it bad? How many people think it's good? How many people think it's bad? How many people didn't put their hand up? You're allowed, you're allowed to sit on the fence here because the answer is somewhere in between. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, where am I? Here. So all I've showed you so far was that they took the gene from the jellyfish and they put it into some bacteria. And that's all well and good, but bacteria are really boring. <laughs> I'm looking at the person who works on bacteria for a living here, but no, no. Bacteria are boring, but there's lots of other animals that we might want to try transforming with GFP. And sure enough, here's Drosophila. And Drosophila is the little fruit fly. I think somebody else mentioned that they work on these beasties earlier. So that's a Drosophila, and it contains the gene from the jellyfish, and it glows. Okay, so what? So what? You're, you're telling us all these stories about, oh, look, who believes that's a real picture? Or did I, just, did I just Photoshop that? Alba 
was, I speak in the past tense because she has long since departed now, rabbits don't live that long, she was one of the first big mammals that was transformed with GFP. And in those days, they had a little webcam above her cage. And I remember, I used to log in at nighttime, and you could watch the green fluorescent rabbit hopping around. She really lived her life as a normal, happy, white rabbit, except when you shone UV light on her, when she turned green, really, really bizarre. She was happy. Oh, what about this? Take the gene from the jellyfish and put it into fish. Aren't they cute? So those are, those are zebra danio fish, the, the little zebra fish that you have swimming around in your freshwater aquariums. Um, now, this is something, the glowfish comes from scientific research, but in fact, this is a company in America that's commercialized the idea of pets that are fluorescent. It's not licensed in any other country as far as I know, but you can actually go buy these fluorescent fish in the States. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? So far, we've got, we've got bacteria, and an insect, Drosophila, we've got a rabbit, we've got fish. This is a gene from a jellyfish, and it works in all of these animals. Let's see if we've got any others. Ah. So these are rhesus macaques, and they're a pair of little baby guys, and they're so cute if you watch the video of them. Do you believe they're green and fluorescent? Look at that. I mean, that really, really looks like a bit of Photoshop wizardry to me. These guys are perfectly happy and healthy little monkeys, now full-grown monkeys, but why? Okay, so I've been skirting the issue, haven't I? I've been talking about genetic modification, but why, why, why are we making green animals? Dun, dun, dun. If, if I can make a green fluorescent rabbit or mouse or rhesus macaque, you remember how close the monkeys were to humans in that evolutionary tree, why can't I make a green human being? Who said ethics? Who said it's illegal? Yeah, and probably rightly so too. I really lament the fact though, I really wish I could experiment on my undergraduate students. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> it's not, it's not. So somebody, this is a good question. Somebody's saying, is it the complexity? No. I could make a green fluorescent human just as easy as I could make a green fluorescent rabbit. It's the exact same technique. We're mammals, they're mammals. We're very, very close in evolution. There's no difference at all, but there is an ethical consideration. We really don't experiment on humans. A lot of people will tell you that we shouldn't be experimenting on animals either, and that's another whole debate, animal rights issues. <laughs> what if I made one of these and it went horribly wrong? Oh, <laughs> Don't mess with the genetically modified green fluorescent human. <laughs> Seriously. I know that I could make a green fluorescent human because, of course, in research labs, we have cell lines, mammalian cell lines that come from humans. These cells pictured here are cells in a petri dish, and they're growing in tissue culture, and they continue to be happy and healthy and divide. I'll play the movie, see if you can spot the cells dividing. The green is green fluorescence, and by the way, the red in the nuclei of each cell is red fluorescent protein. Watch for the bright sparks that appear, and then you'll see the cells dividing. There goes one there. Here's one. Yeah. That's mitosis, if you remember your biology. Look at that. Bang. Bang. Fantastic. Those are human cells. Cells that were cultured from a human many years ago, and they've just been kept alive in cell culture. Now, we use human cells to study all sorts of diseases, to study how cells work. Remember me with the picture of my cell that looked like a dog? And I was like all amazed about the endoplasmic reticulum and how it moves around. Well, of course, we use these cells to study the exact same 
things. We want to know how cells do their job, how proteins are made and how proteins move around in a cell and get to where they're supposed to be. And that's why we have these beautiful human cells expressing fluorescent proteins. Ah. If you're a scientist and you work with genetic modification, you're faced with this on a daily basis. You won't be familiar with the Daily Mail, a newspaper in Britain. Are you familiar with the term tabloid? Are you familiar with this term? <laughs> Uncovered the toxic gene hiding in GM crops. Revelation throws new doubt over safety of foods. Okay, now I'm not, I'm not being a complete advocate for genetic modification. Just bear with me before you start throwing things at me. But tabloid journalism is just like this all the time. Look at this one. Here's another Daily Mail headline. <laughs> you probably all got cancer now because you've been on Facebook. I know you've been on Facebook. Right. Tabloid newspapers like to stir the shit, but when they do it, the undereducated or non-skeptical faction of the society read those headlines and they say, did you hear that GM is toxic and you're going to die if you eat it? And, and, and that's not fair. Because you guys are interested in science, you know that if some scientist stands up here on the stage and says, oh, GM is completely safe. You're not going to believe that scientist, are you? If I stand here right now and say, GM is completely safe, you're going to say, bullshit. And if I say, GM is completely lethal and it's going to kill you, I would hope you're also going to say, bullshit. Where's the evidence? Let's do the studies. All of these newspaper articles about genetic modification say, we absolutely can't have genetic modification because they haven't done enough tests on it. But then at the same time, when I write my grant proposal and I say, I want to test some genetic modification, they say, oh no, you can't do that. You can't do tests on genetic modification. Well, how can we do the tests if we can't do the tests, if you see what I mean? So anyway, anyway, we were talking about some highly scientific questions that you might ask. And the other one that I was going to address was, OK, so the glowing mouse exists. There he is. What's it good for except entertainment? I mean, he was really funny, wasn't he, when he was running around? Everybody would like to have a little fluorescent glowing pet, as you've seen from the little fish that were swimming around. But really, really, why are all these scientists doing genetic modification? What if the mouse had a disease, like diabetes or Alzheimer's or cancer, and the techniques of genetic modification could cure that disease? Wouldn't that make it a little bit more worthwhile? In most people's minds, that does make it a little bit more worthwhile. And that's, in fact, why the governments of different countries are giving money to scientists to study using genetic modification techniques. GM is still largely contained in the lab, but if, if they believe me when I write to them and say, I can use the techniques that made this little mouse here in working towards curing cancer, then the government says, ah, let's give them some money. Let's, let's give them some money. Let's let them do some research for a couple of years, and then let's see what the results are. Let's see if it happens. So. Now we're doing real science, okay? This is where we're not fooling around anymore. Now I'm not talking about fluffy little mice anymore. Now, now we're going to solve some disease problems. You heard the term mutation earlier on. Remember before I split this chromosome and I inserted a gene, and I had put the gene for GFP in here, and that's what makes the mouse glow. Now, GFP is a convenient gene to test the principle of genetic modification with. Do you know why it's convenient? Because all you have to do to know if the protein is in there, to know if the genetic modification has worked, 
is just shine the light on the organism and you see the green fluorescence. That's exactly why we make green fluorescent mice, because we know that our techniques to modify the organism work the way we're doing them. If I put a gene for a different protein in, a protein that's not fluorescent, then I have to do a lot more work to determine if the protein is actually being made. We have to extract the protein from the animal and do all sorts of other biochemical analysis. So the mouse basically, we call a proof of concept, right? We know the technique works. Now, let's go back to talking about disease. Let's say there's a gene in your genome, and I told you earlier that you've got 25,000 of them. And let's say there's a mutation in one of them, just a base pair in the DNA that's wrong, because as we heard earlier, it's inevitable. There are mutations in DNA. That's what drives evolution. But let's say that the base pair change this time means that the protein that this gene is supposed to make doesn't work. That happens a lot. And when that protein doesn't work, you have a disease be it Alzheimer's or a type of cancer or diabetes or something like that, what scientists doing medical biology want to do is use genetic modification to cure diseases. What we want to do in this case is replace this gene with a good copy of the gene, a gene that makes the protein that we want it to make. So we already know with the mouse that if we put GFP in there, the animal cells will be full of GFP. What if we do this? What if we put a good copy of the gene that was causing the cancer, and it works, and the cell fills up with the good protein? That would mean that the person or the animal suffering from the cancer wouldn't get the cancer anymore. That's called a cure. That's the sort of stuff that we put in grant proposals based on some real deep science. And we show that this sort of stuff is possible. I'll give you an example. This is a bit grisly, and I'm sorry, but that's a green fluorescent mouse. The big red thing here is a giant tumor. That's a cancer tumor. And the tumor is marked with red fluorescent protein in this case, just so that we can demonstrate that mice get cancer too. Using the techniques of, of molecular biology though, we can start to target these cancers here so that we can get rid of them and, in a sense, cure the cancer. So this is from a recent paper here. This, in this series of three images, is a tumor. You see it's big here, and then it gets smaller, and then it seems to have disappeared completely. Well, the tumor in that series of three images is marked by green fluorescent protein. You see it's big here, medium-sized, very small indeed. The green is just so that we can see the tumor but there's another gene that's been put in at the same time. It's called GLONC1, oncogene 1. And what's happened here is that a good copy of oncogene 1 has been put in, and that's caused a cure of the cancer situation. We've actually targeted a tumor so we can see it, and then we've replaced a defective gene so that the tumor goes away. Absolutely amazing. Now, I'm not done yet, but... And by the way, don't, don't, don't think that I'm taking credit for that research. That is absolutely outstanding research done by some other lab. But that is absolutely beautiful stuff. Look at that. Um, and we can do the same. You know, by the way, people that don't know about medicine always say, why can't scientists just cure cancer, right? It's, it's not simple. All cancers are based on cells pro proliferating, but of course, cancers arise in every different organ of the body because of defects in all sorts of different genes. So there's lots of research yet to be done. A couple more things. Here's, you know, I'm a plant biologist. Here's a story that's been going for a few years now. Lots and lots of children in the world. This rice could save a million kids a year, and it could save a lot more from going blind. If you live exclusively on a diet of rice, it turns out that rice is missing a gene one of the precursors to vitamin A, and you need vitamin A to, to see and ultimately to stay alive. And so people that are, are on subsistence diets that, uh, that are, are exclusively of rice will eventually die of malnutrition if they haven't gone blind, maybe they've gone blind already, but this is an easy, easy fix. You replace the GFP gene with a gene that is the precursor to vitamin A, you transform it into the rice plants, 
These are fields, by the way, of what's called golden rice. The rice looks golden. Even the grains look beautiful and golden because they've got vitamin A, which is the, the stuff that makes carrots orange, right? It's supposed to be the stuff that's good for your eyes. You see how all this comes together? This rice has been available for almost 10 years. But because of the great big controversy around the world about, oh, you can't let GM out, it's going to, you know, all, all the arguments, GM being in the hands of big agriculture companies and, and Indian farmers committing suicide and all those sort of stories which aren't true, um, this rice isn't doing its job yet. It's not being fed to those millions of children, and it should be. So Nature Magazine, now this is the exact opposite from the tabloid journal that I showed you earlier. This is one of the world's two most famous science journals. The other one's called Science. Nature is the one that comes from England, and as scientists, we all strive to get a paper published in Nature because that's the ultimate thing. Nature considered very, very carefully the genetic modification debate, and you know what they came up with? They came up with the idea that an extremist viewpoint isn't good. And I mean an extremist viewpoint on either side, saying, GM is fantastic, it's going to save the world. No. Saying, GM is, is pure evil, you're releasing Franken foods, you're going to kill us all. No. The truth is somewhere in the middle, and as proper inquiring skeptical scientists, what we do is we consider all of the risks. There are some real risks associated with GM, and the environmental movement point them out. And a scientist doesn't say, oh no, forget it, that's stupid. A scientist says, oh yeah, that's a risk, and I'm going to try and figure out a way that I can solve that problem. So that's what we're working towards. That's what it's all about. This is like a Richard Dawkins thing. Do you think that this little girl made this sign? Or do you think her parents put the sign in her hand for a photo opportunity? I think her parents will be delighted if genetic modification comes up with a technique that will cure that girl of a disease that she might get someday. I'm not trying to scaremonger, I'm just saying, when somebody says we are not science experiments, why not? The scientists are doing good things. Most committed scientists are people that want to do really, really good things for the world. We're really not <laughs> Dr. Evil. That's not, that's not, I, I, I kind of would like to have my own secret lair, you know, down in a subterranean cave or something, but no. Uh, Vasi, I think, when she was introducing me, said that I'm Dr. Molecule, so although I'm a plant biologist, I go on the radio every week and just talk about whatever the current science topic of the day is. I've got a blog, which is called All Things Science, and I'm on Twitter as well, at John Runyon's, but watch out, you saw what happened when I was tweeting about God earlier on today, big earthquakes. Um, one more thing, one more thing. Those, those same tabloids that say, oh, genetic modification is bad. What, what if my glowing green mouse gets out of control? What are we going to do? I got it covered. Kubo, getting down with it. Yeah, we got glowing green cats as well. So, Sophia, I, I just, I'm absolutely honored that you guys invited me here today, and I want to thank you so much. So that's Lubo and Vasi, and Emil is here, and I met Bobby earlier, all those guys that are running things back in the back there. Ratio, I'm going to tell this story to everybody everywhere. This is absolutely fantastic. Thanks for having me. Oh, I just, one more thing, real quick. If I was going to genetically modify a human being, guess who it would be? 